I'm so glad to be here with you, and I'm going to ask you if you would do me a favor this morning just to start out, and that is that, that we're going to have a prayer together, and it's one that maybe you've said before, you've experienced before. I'm, I'm guessing most of you are going to know this prayer, so we're just going to pray this together. So we're going to put it up on the screen for you, all right? So here we go. Just, let's just read it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. How many of you have ever prayed that prayer before today? How many? Come on, raise your hands. You've ever prayed any? Okay. For most of us. All right, great. I remember, this is called the Lord's Prayer, and, and, and most of us, like we said, have prayed this. I remember in high school, uh, at a public high school, we prayed this every Friday night before we left the locker room. I don't know if the coaches thought this was magic or it would help us win. It really didn't help us win a lot of games, but to be honest with you. Um, but we prayed this every single time before we ran out onto the field. And here's what I know about this church. Prayer is powerful in this church. I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. It, it, it is powerful. And in fact, we're in this series called God Box, and you guys know that if you've been coming or if you're new today or you're online and this is your first time checking the church out. We're, we're in this series called God Box, and what we've been looking at is what God's Word says about prayer for our lives and, and really how important it is for you and I to be people of prayer. So this series was designed so that, so that you and I can tap into and grow our prayer life. As a matter of fact, does anybody need a box? Anybody, maybe it's your first time or you haven't been able to get one um, or it's your, you know, you've just walked in here today, you don't have a, you don't have a, a box. Raise your hand. They're going to get you a box, okay? All right. Really, this is, this is what we're going to be talking about today is that prayer really isn't about upgrading. It's, this, this, this series isn't about upgrading the language of our prayers, right? It's not like changing our, our, what we say to God or how we say things to God. It's about up, up, upping the intensity, the depth of our prayer life. So I, I want you to know this. I, uh, I sent your pastor, um, and I know Pastor Peter's one of your pastors, but I'm going to talk about him for just a minute. Pastor Peter, I sent him a text this week. And I said, bro, and I can say that to him because that's how I communicate with him. I said, bro, you are knocking this thing out of the park. I said, I want you to know you've challenged me. And I've been following along, and I keep up with your church, and I keep up with your messages, and I love what's going on. And I want you to know that I've heard a lot of, of in, my, in my 29 years as a, as a full-time pastor, I have heard a lot of series on prayer. And I'm going to tell you this is at the very top. So I want you to know that your pastor, it, when he says he's praying for you, he's praying for you. And I can tell you why. Because this morning when we met at 8 o'clock and he took me into his study, on his wall are dozens and dozens and dozens of notes for people that he's praying for. So I just want you to know that. I don't have to tell you that. I didn't have to say anything, but I want, I want you to know, and I want you to know what an amazing pastor that you have, okay? So make sure you, this week, you, you say that to him. And by the way, behind every great pastor is an amazing wife. So say that to Tiffany as well this week. Give them both a hug. Tell them how much you love them, all right? And let them know you're praying for them. So the first week was the power of prayer. And Pastor Peter said this, that prayer is a pipeline to God's power. So let me ask you the question, where do you need God's power the most in your life right now? Is it a relationship? Is it a diagnosis? Is it a health issue? Is it a wayward child? Is it a job? Is it your finances? Where do you need God's power? The second week was persistent prayer. If it's on your mind, Pastor Peter said, bring it to God's heart. What, what is it that you want to ask God for? But maybe, you just, maybe you're just a little nervous about asking him. Or maybe you've asked him, but you don't want to keep asking him because you feel like you're bugging him, right? It's like God and the kid. Come on, Dad. 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 And finally, you know, just kind of wears you down. Listen, God wants to hear from you. Keep asking him for that. And then last week was about getting prayer right. See, God never ignores our prayers. Now, I got to tell you, this is a hard one for me. Maybe it's not for you. 
But this is a difficult one. I, I was in here this morning. We were kind of going through the slides, and, and we, were, we were having this conversation. and was talking to the guys in the back, these, the tech guys that are running things, and they're so incredible. They're so good at what they do. And I said, guys, I want to tell you, this is a hard one for me. And I hear from the back, yep, me too. So I'm like, okay, good, good. It's not just me. God never ignores our prayer. He just may not answer our prayer the way we want him to answer our prayer. See, prayer isn't really trying to force God's hand. God, if you are really who you say you are, you need to do this for me. Mm. Prayer is simply a, an act of submission and a dependence on God. And so if you're new with us today, whether you're here in person or you're online, there's a, there's a verse that Pastor Peter's been using kind of to wrap everything around this series. And it's found in Ephesians 6.18, and it says this, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So today what we're going to talk about is this. What is the point of prayer? What is the point of prayer? Have you ever noticed how parents and grandparents love to hear their children and grandchildren pray? I mean, it is so precious, especially when they're really small. You know, they, they fold their hands and then they close their eyes really tight. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? And they sincerely say something like this. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. And I mean, it is so cute. It, it is so cute to hear kids pray like that. But what we recognize sometimes or what we realize sometimes is that sometimes the kid is saying it so fast and they're not really considering what it truly means. Now, I understand that. Sometimes they're sitting at Chick-fil-A and the food's in front of them, and they're like, God is great, God is good, thank you for our food, amen. Right, they want to get to the Chick-fil-A. I totally understand that. But if we're honest, it's not just kids who pray like that sometimes, right? I do too. Maybe we all do. So is the point of prayer to, to blow through prayer as quickly as we can? Is the point of prayer to say the right words so that we get God's attention? Is the point of prayer to get everything we pray for answered exactly like you and I want it answered? Let me give you three, three, three things. No, no, and no. So what is the point of prayer? Here's what I want you to walk out of here with today. If you don't hear anything else today, if you can wrap around this and grab a hold of this, it will, it will absolutely radically change your life. And that is this, that prayer is not a button to be pushed, but a relationship to be pursued. Prayer is not a button to be pushed. Okay, God, here I am. I pushed it. It's like the Staples easy button. God, I'm going to push it. That was easy, and I'm done. See, that's not what prayer really is. Prayer is really a relationship to be pursued after. And if you and I take a deep dive, what we're going to discover is that prayer is first and foremost all about pursuing and developing a relationship with God. The God who created the world and therefore, guess what, created you and me. That's what it's about. And there's really a big reason that this is important for us today. There's really a big reason that it's not about pushing the button, but it's about pursuing the relationship. Whether you're here or online, here's the big reason. God created you and I to have a relationship with us. He created you, and you to have a relationship with you. He created me to have a relationship with me. See, there's this longing in every single person that God put in there. And the thing is that only God can satisfy that longing. So God can, wants to, to connect with us on a relational level. He wants to hear about our hopes and dreams. He wants to, to knit our heart to his heart, to connect us. He longs to have these deep conversations with us, not a monologue from us. And one of the ways that our relationship with God grows is through prayer. And it's in those conversations that God begins to fortify our faith. It's in those conversations that he begins to, to develop that belief in us and that, or, or that belief in him and that trust in him. So he starts to just, just work in us so that our faith and our belief and our trust in him begin to grow. And he begins to expand our hearts and he begins to help us understand his heart for us. And when that happens, it answers two big questions that I believe every single person within this building or online have. Here's the first one. Does God really want a relationship with me? Let's be honest. Sometimes we doubt that. 
Does God really want a relationship with me? Does he really love me? Does he really care about me? Does he genuinely want this relationship with me? And here, I think, is one of the biggest questions that every single person on this planet deals with. Is God trustworthy? Can I trust him with all my hurts? I love Rick Warren. He says, all my hurts, all, all my hurts, all my habits, and all my hang-ups. And it's a great phrase. Can I trust him with the big stuff, the small stuff, the in-between stuff? Can I trust him with the good stuff, the bad stuff, the ugly stuff, and let's be honest, the really, really ugly stuff? A.W. Tozer was a theologian. He was a pastor. He was a mentor. He was an author. And he said this. I think it's one of the best quotes I've ever heard. He said this, what comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And here's why. Because it affects everything else in your life. If it affects everything else in your life, guess what? What you think about God also affects your prayer life. And if you aren't sure that God wants to have a relationship with you, that God truly loves you, and you aren't sure that God is trustworthy, chances are you're not going to consistently go to God, dig in, and pursue a relationship with him through prayer. Instead, what we're going to do, if we're not sure, is go, all right, I'm just going to push the button and keep moving. Instead of pursuing that relationship, because I'm not sure how God feels about me. I'm not sure what God thinks about me. And when we live that way, what are we left with? We're, we're left with just pushing the prayer button and missing out on a meaningful, life-changing, daily relationship with God. Now, why does that matter? Why does that matter? Because pursuing a relationship with God through prayer helps you and I realize that even when life is not good, God is. Ooh. See, even when life is not good, God is. Last July, our, our youngest daughter, Aubrey, came to us. She's married to Daniel, 23 years old. We're sitting around our kitchen table, and she said, hey, Mom, we got something for you. And she opened, my wife, Anita, opened this little package, and there was a little, little onesie, infant onesie. Well, man, the tears were flowing. I was crying like a bad snot dripping down my nose. I mean, you know, I'm just so... Oh. So we're just excited. Two weeks later, we get a call. She's in Orlando with Daniel and his family. She has to go to the hospital. She has a miscarriage. Two weeks later, after this, she's at the doctor, and the doctor looks her in the eye and says, you have choriocarcinoma cancer at 23. What do you do with that? What do you do with that kind of brokenness and pain and hurt, and loss. See, it's not just me. It's you too. Some of you are in here today are dealing with pain, and hurt, and betrayal. You're dealing with a struggle in a relationship with a, could be a spouse, could be a friend, could, could be a, 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 somebody that you've known in your past that you used to be really, really connected with, and now all of a sudden that relationship is just, it's just drifting. Maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a sibling. What do you do in, in, those conver in, in those moments of life when there's hurt and there's pain? See, when you and I have been pursuing God in a relationship and not just putting the button, it's in those times, it is especially in those times that this relationship with God helps us do something. And here's what it helps us do. It helps us doubt our doubts and believe our beliefs. What do you mean, Steve? It helps us doubt our doubts when the enemy comes and goes, yeah, see, if God really loved you, your daughter wouldn't have to go through that, Steve. She wouldn't have to go through chemo. She wouldn't have to take a month off of work being a first grade teacher because she's on chemo. See, Steve, if God really loved you. See, those are the doubts that come, isn't it? You know that and I know that. Instead, when we have been pursuing God and not just hitting the button, we can come to a God who we know is good, a God who knows us, a God who loves us, a God whose heart we are connected to. And instead of going, hey, you know what, God, I doubt you, here's what I know. You are good even when things don't feel and look good. That's why it's so essential to pursue a relationship with God. That's why it's so essential. 
See, prayer is not a button to be pushed, but a relationship to be pursued. We're going to look at two passages today. Two passages today. They're going to be very quick. They're going to be very short. And it's two passages where Jesus is talking about the importance of a relationship with God. And in these 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 two passages, he uses intentional, relational language. One of them may surprise you a bit. The other may not. But he uses intentional, relational language. Why? Because both passages are a picture of how Jesus says you and I can relate to God. And it's a picture of how we can come to God and address him. In other words, these passages tell us what a relationship looks like with God where we're living at today. So here we go. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew 6. You've already prayed the prayer. We're going to look at it real quick. It's going to be on the screen. There it is, right there. Now, two things. This is often referred to as the Lord's Prayer. You know that. But honestly, this is more of an example to follow. And some of it could never be prayed by Jesus anyway. Because when it says, forgive our debts, what that's saying is forgive our sins. And Jesus never sinned. So more accurately, what we might want to call this is the disciples' prayer. If we're going to be really honest. The second thing is you notice on the end there, there's, there's no for years of the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That, this phrase is really absent from most of the early Greek manuscripts. And most experts believe that sometime after, shortly after the 6th century, this was kind of added to facilitate more of a, a worshipful reading of the passage. So this is how Jesus starts. His disciples are trying to figure out how to pray. And Jesus says this, our Father in heaven. In other words, Jesus is saying this. We need to come to God and understand that we are created and he is the creator. That that there is a clear distinction between us and God. That we are sinful, that God is sinless. That we are bound by time and we're bound and God is not. That he is outside of time and he is outside of space. But there's also some similarities. Jesus said you and I can come to God and call him Father. Now, we talk about our founding fathers in the United States, right? None of us would ever say that Benjamin Franklin or George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or John Adams was our personal father, would we? Unless you have a dad that's actually named that, right? <laughs> but in the same way, Jesus said this, because in the Jew, to the Jews in the day when Jesus was speaking this, they never referred to, G- to God as their personal father. It was just the father over the nation, And so there was this disconnect from a personal relationship with God. And and Jesus says, no, 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 we need to change that. And so every time we see, almost every single time we see Jesus praying, he refers to God as his father. It is personal. He says, listen, you need to disconnect from this non-personal way of, of viewing God. Instead, I want you to understand that when I say father, this is personal, that you are connecting to the person of God. He says, that's the way I want you to look at it. See, more than just being a creator, more than just being the big man upstairs, Jesus uses Father as a highly relational term, recognizing God as our provider, as our director, as our protector, as our corrector. And then I'm going to kind of push through this pretty quickly. Hallowed be your name simply means to recognize God as holy, that he's different from all others, right? And that, that we have this desire to, to recognize him as holy. Here's a thought I always try to think. Before I ask the Father, I try to honor the Father. Something to throw at you. That's for free today, okay? That's just a personal thing for me. Before I ask God for something, I try to honor God. God, you are holy. You are mighty. You, 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 are, you are unlimited, and I am very limited. You are, you, are, you are forever and ever, and I am not. I am finite. You are not. So I try to honor him. Your kingdom come. Here's the thing. Would you agree that sin has messed all of us up as human beings? Would you agree with that? I know it's messed me up. I'm guessing you probably say the same thing. And there's times, I'm going to be honest, I like to be in control and call my own shots. Now, I know nobody else struggles with that in this room, but I do. And here's what I'm going to tell you. When I do that, it never ends well. It never ends well, but I still love to do it. This is simply a reminder that God's plan is so much better than our plan. About, it's about what he wants for us, not what we want for ourselves. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever had a plan, an idea, and you take it to somebody, 
and you go, hey, man, here is my idea. And they're like, that is amazing. Hey, have you ever thought of maybe you could do this, this, and this? And by the time you're done the conversation, your plan just got even better. Has that ever happened to you? Because it happens to me all the time. I guess that means I don't have great plans. I don't know. Anyway, I mean, you just, you come away from the conversation, you're like, wow, they really added to this. Whoa, this is an amazing plan. Very similar to what God's saying here. He's saying this, God, your plan's better than my plan. My plan's not even close. I'm giving you my plan, and guess what? You can take it, and you can run with it, and you can make it your plan, and whatever your plan is, I'm going to follow. That's what he's talking about there. Give us this day our daily bread. The disciples would have went, whoa, hey, he's talking about when the Israelites were wandering for 40 years in the desert, and every morning there was manna for them. It's just a reminder that we're not self-sufficient, that we actually need God. And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Now, I'm going to land here for just a minute. There's two parts to this one. Here's the truth. I need to seek God's forgiveness often. You say, Steve, wait a minute. I I thought God forgave me for all my past, all my present, all my future. He has. But when I do something and I sin against a holy God, it can create a little bit of a rift in our relationship. Does it end the relationship? Absolutely not. But it can create a little tension. And I need to come to him and say, God, I messed up. I blew it, I sinned, I did whatever, fill in the blank for you, for me, and I'm just going to ask you to forgive me. I'm going to ask you to forgive me. So as we seek God, not just as pushing a button, but we seek this relationship, confession should be a consistent part of pursuing our relationship with God through prayer. Whatever that looks like, we need to confess our attitudes or our thoughts or our actions or our inactions or the disobedience in our lives, whatever that looks like. So that's the first part of this, but the second part of it is this. Here's what I know. Most of us in here have been hurt by somebody. Maybe the church, maybe a friend, maybe a family member, maybe somebody that you trusted that just absolutely took you out at the knees, that stabbed you in the back, whatever you, however you want to look at it. So consistently you and I need to say, hey, God, I need your help to forgive somebody. I need your help to to forgive the people who have hurt me, who have sinned against me, who have damaged me. See, there's a word we call that. It's called, ready, mercy. Mercy means that you and I are so deeply grateful for the forgiveness we've received that we cannot help but offering someone else that same forgiveness. See, when you and I forget mercy, we think we're deserving. And when we think we're deserving, we find it all too easy not to extend mercy to others. And then he finishes it up with this, and lead us not into temptation, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, some of you are saying, does God lead me into temptation? Absolutely not. If you want to take a look at that, dive into James chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. I'm, there you go. You can, you can look at that later. It makes it clear God doesn't tempt us to sin, but deliver us from evil. This simply says, God, we need direction. We, we, we need direction, so we're going to ask you as we're going through our lives, as we're processing through temptation all around us, we need you to help us get through this. And not only that, but we get to pray for other people that we know are dealing with temptations in their lives. So Jesus makes it clear that we have a personal father, that we can pursue a relationship with this holy God, a God who has a better plan for your life than my life. Better plan for you than me. Or a better plan for you than you have for yourself. A better plan than I have for my own life. Excuse me. I got confused there for a second. A father who will supply your daily needs. A father who forgives and helps and forgives, helps you forgive others who have hurt you and help, helps me forgive them too. A father who delivers strength to help us through temptation. Now, I want to give you one more picture, one more quick passage. So here's what I want you to do. Would you close your eyes? Would you think about the last time you spent time with good friends? Just think about it. Just go back in your mind's eye. What was that conversation like? Did that conversation flow freely or did you have to really work at it? Was there laughter? Were there smiles? Did you experience joy? Did you feel understood and valued by your friend? Were you encouraged? Did you feel seen? Did you feel heard?
Did you feel cared for? Did you walk away from that encounter emotionally filled? Was your time relaxed? Open your eyes for me. Jesus gives us a second way that we can relate to God and address him. And that is this word, ready? Friend. Friend. As a matter of fact, he says, in the passage we're going to look at, he says this, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for their friends. And he looks at his disciples and he says this, no longer you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. What a passage for you and I. See, what Jesus is saying is, yes, you can address God as Father. It is a personal relationship. You can come to God and know he is holy, that he is mighty, that he is stronger than you, that he is wiser than you. But at the same time, we can come to God understanding that God desires to be our friend. Vicki sang a song this morning. It's called The Goodness of God. And I love these words. It says, I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. And in the darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. Did you catch that? I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. I want to show you a quick picture of my family. By the way, our daughter is doing wonderful. She is one, two, three, four. Got to sing from this way. How's that? One, two, three, four. She's standing there right by me. She's doing fantastic. The chemo has worked. Her blood work's coming back great, and we're praising God for that. So our two daughters, two son-in-laws on that end, my wife, who I way out punted my coverage on, Anita right there, and then my son, Jacob. People tell us we look a little bit alike. I don't see it, but... Um, so here's what Jacob and I, he's 28 years old now, married to a beautiful lady, love our daughter-in-law, three, three kids. You know, the thing about our relationship is this, that Jacob loves me as his dad. We have an amazing relationship. He honors me as his father. He, he looks to me and he, 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 sa- you know, he, he says, Dad, I, you're my dad and I love you as my father and, and I, just, I, I, I just look up to you as a dad. But what we've noticed is as he's matured, he's still respectful, he's still loving, he's still honoring, he's still kind, he still kind of puts me on that dad pedestal. But at the same time, our relationship has taken on another dimension. And here's what it's taken on. It's taken on the dimension as friends. See, where he once used to have to spend time with me because I was the authority figure and he was the kid has now changed. And now he chooses to spend time with me. Especially when I call him and say, hey, I'll pay for Chipotle if you want to meet for lunch. I mean, he's there all, he's waiting on me. He's waiting on me. We did that this week. And that's what I'm trying to help us understand today, is that God wants us to move into a relationship with him as a father. But God also invites you and I to know him as a friend. God invites you and I to know him as both a father and a friend. So let me ask you this question. When is the last time you were pursuing the relationship with God, not pushing the button, pursuing the relationship with God, and some of those same characteristics that you had in your mind's eye just a minute ago were present? Joy and laughter and just this time of relaxing and this time of conversation in this time of being emotionally just filled to overflowing. Can I ask you a question? Is that what your prayer life's been like lately? Is that what you want your prayer life to be like? Because that's what I want my prayer life to be like. And God says, if you will take time to pursue the relationship with me and not just put the, push the button, that's exactly what you can experience. See, you and I can pursue prayer with God for the relationship, not just the reward. And the crazy thing is, and God's 
the way God's kingdom works, it's so upside down. When you and I pursue God for the relationship, guess what we get? The reward. But sometimes we have it backwards and we go, God, I just want the reward. Push my button. Help me. We want to win the game. I want the house. I want the new car. I want the position. I want the play. I want the part. I want to, I want to be the starting quarterback. I want the lead in the play. Whatever that looks like for you. And instead, God says, listen, if you will pursue me in the relationship, you will get the reward. Does that mean you're going to get all of that? No. What you're going to get is the best part of the reward. And the best part of the reward is that you and I will have a relationship where we can come to God as not only a father, but a friend. Think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute. That you and I can come to God, and just like in a, a moment ago in your mind's eye, you had that picture of hanging out with your friends, you and I can have that same type of experience with God. But we have to pursue Him in a relationship and not just press the button. It's not a button to be pushed, it's a relationship to be pursued. Is that where you're living in your prayer life? If not, you can start today.